Chapter 11, Part 2 of Fifty Years in Chains or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Fifty Years in Chains or The Life of an American Slave by Charles Ball. Chapter 11, Part 2. The reader may suppose from my account of the bacon that I, too, had adopted this rule as a part of my creed, but I solemnly declare that this was not the case, and that I never deprived any one of all the masters that I have served of anything against his consent unless it was some kind of food, and that of all I ever took, I am confident I have given away more than the half to my fellow slaves, whom I knew to be equally needy with myself." The man who had been with me at the keelboat told me one day that he had laid a plan by which we could get thirty or forty dollars if I would join him in the execution of his project. Thirty or forty dollars was a large sum of money to me. I had never possessed so much money at one time in my life, and I told him that I was willing to do anything by which we could obtain such a treasure. He then told me that he knew where the mule and cart that were used by the man who carried away our fish were kept at night, and that he intended to set out on the first dark night and go to the plantation, harness the mule to the cart, go to the cotton gin house, put two bags of cotton in the cart, bring them to a thicket of small pines that grew on the river bank a short distance below the fishery, and leave them there until the keelboat should return. All that he desired of me was to make some excuse for his absence to the other hands and assist him to get his cotton into the canoe at the coming of the boat. I disliked the whole scheme, both on account of its iniquity and of the danger which attended it, but my companion was not to be discouraged by all the arguments which I could use against it, and said if I would not participate in it, he was determined to undertake it alone, provided I would not inform against him. To this I said nothing, but he had so often heard me express my detestation of one slave betraying another that I presume he felt easy on that score. The next night, but one after this conversation, was very dark, and when we went to lay out this sane after night, Nero was missing. The other people inquired of me if I knew where he was, and when I replied in the negative, little more was said on the subject it being common for the slaves to absent themselves from their habitations at night, and if the matter is not discovered by the overseer or master, nothing is ever said of it by the slaves. The other people supposed that in this instance Nero had gone to see a woman whom he lived with as his wife on a plantation a few miles down the river, and were willing to work a little harder to permit him to enjoy the pleasure of seeing his family. He returned before day and said he had been to see his wife, which satisfied the curiosity of our companions. The very next evening after Nero's absence, the keelboat descended the river, came down on our side, hailed us at the fishery, and, drawing in to the shore below our landing, made her ropes fast among the young pines of which I have spoken above. After we made our first haul I missed Nero, but he returned to us before we had laid out the seine and told us that he had been in the woods to collect some light wood, dry, resinous pine, which he brought on his shoulder. When the morning came, the keelboat was gone, and everything wore the ordinary aspect about our fishery. But when the man came with the mule and the cart to take away the fish, he told us that there was great trouble on the plantation. The overseer had discovered that someone had stolen two bags of cotton the last night, and all the hands were undergoing an examination on the subject. The slaves on the plantation, one and all, denied having any knowledge of the matter, and as there was no evidence against anyone, the overseer threatened, at the time he left the quarter, to whip every hand on the estate for the purpose of making them discover who the thief was. The slaves on the plantation differed in opinion as to the perpetrator of this theft, but the greater number concurred in charging it upon a free negro named Ismael, who lived in a place called the White Oak Woods, and followed making plows and harrow frames. He also made handles for hoes and the framework of cart bodies. This man was generally reputed a thief for a great distance round the country, 
and the black people charged him with stealing the cotton on no other evidence than his general bad character. The overseer, on the other hand, expressed his opinion without hesitation, which was that the cotton had been stolen by some of the people of the plantation and sold to a poor white man who resided at the distance of three miles back in the pine woods and was believed to have dealt with slaves as a receiver of their stolen goods for many years. This white man was one of a class of poor cottagers. The house or cabin in which he resided was built of small poles of the yellow pine with the bark remaining on them. The roof was of clapboards of pine, and the chimney was made of sticks and mud raised to the height of eight or ten feet. The appearance of the man and his wife was such as one might expect to find in such a dwelling. The lowest poverty had, through life, been the companion of these poor people, of which their clayey complexions, haggard figures, and tattered garments gave the strongest proof. It appeared to me that the state of destitution in which these people lived afforded very convincing evidence that they were not in possession of the proceeds of the stolen goods of any person. I had often been at the cabin of this man in my trapping expeditions the previous autumn and winter, and I believe the overseer regarded the circumstance that black people often called at his house as conclusive evidence that he held criminal intercourse with them. However this might be, the overseer determined to search the premises of this harmless forester, whom he resolved beforehand to treat as a guilty man. It being known that I was well acquainted with the woods in the neighborhood of the cabin, I was sent for to leave the fishery and come to assist in making search for the lost bags of cotton. Perhaps it was also believed that I was in the secrets of the suspected house. It was not thought prudent to trust any of the hands on the plantation in making the intended search, as they were considered the principal thieves, whilst we of the fishery, against whom no suspicion had arisen, were required to give our assistance in ferreting out the perpetrators of an offense of the highest grade that can be committed by a slave on a cotton estate. Before leaving the fishery, I advised the master to be very careful not to let the overseer, or my master, know that he had left us to manage the fishery at night by ourselves, since, as the theft had been committed, it might possibly be charged upon him if it were known that he had allowed us so much liberty. I said this to put the master on his guard against surprise and to prevent him from saying anything that might turn the attention of the overseer to the hands at the fishery, for I knew that if punishment were to fall amongst us, it would be quite as likely to reach the innocent as the guilty. Besides, though I was innocent of the bags of cotton, I was guilty of the bacon, and however I might make distinctions between the moral turpitude of the two cases, I knew that if discovered, they would both be treated alike. When I arrived at the quarter whither I repaired, in obedience to the orders I received, I found the overseer with my master's eldest son, and a young white man who had been employed to repair the cotton gin, waiting for me. I observed when I came near the overseer that he looked at me very attentively, and afterwards called my young master aside and spoke to him in a tone of voice too low to be heard by me. The white gentlemen then mounted their horses and set off by the road for the cabin of the white man. I had orders to take a short route through the woods and across a swamp by which I could reach the cabin as soon as the overseer. The attentive examination that the overseer had given me caused me to feel uneasy, although I could not divine the cause of his scrutiny, nor of the subject of the short conversation between him and my young master. By traveling at a rapid pace, I arrived at the cabin of the suspected man before the gentleman, but thought it prudent not to approach it before they came up, lest it might be imagined that I had gone in to give information to the occupants of the danger that threatened them. Here I had a hard struggle with my conscience, which seemed to say to me that I ought at once to disclose all I knew concerning the lost bags of cotton for the purpose of saving these poor people from the terror that they must necessarily feel at the sight of those who were coming to accuse them of a great crime, perhaps from the afflictions and sufferings attendant upon a prosecution in a court of justice. These reflections were cut short by the arrival of the party of gentlemen who passed me where I sat at the side of the path with no other notice than a simple command of the overseer to come on. 
I followed them into the cabin where we found the man and his wife with two little children eating roasted potatoes. The overseer saluted this family by telling them that we had come to search the house for stolen cotton, that it was well known that he had long been dealing with Negroes, and that they were now determined to bring him to punishment. I was then ordered to tear up the floor of the cabin whilst the overseer mounted into the loft. I found nothing under the floor, and the overseer had no better success above. The wife was then advised to confess where her husband had concealed the cotton to save herself from being brought in as a party to the affair. But this poor woman protested with tears that they were totally ignorant of the whole matter. Whilst the wife was interrogated, the father stood without his own door, trembling with fear, but, as I could perceive, indignant with rage. The overseer, who was fluent in the use of profane language, exerted the highest degree of his vulgar eloquence upon these harmless people, whose only crime was their poverty, and whose weakness alone had invited the ruthless aggression of their powerful and rich neighbors. Finding nothing in the house, the gentleman set out to scour the woods around the cabin, and commanded me to take the lead in tracing out treetops and thickets where it was most likely that the stolen cotton might be found. Our search was in vain, as I knew it would be beforehand, but when wary of ranging in the woods, the gentleman again returned to the cabin which we now found without inhabitants. The alarm caused by our visit, and the manner in which the gentleman had treated this lonely family, had caused them to abandon their dwelling and seek safety in flight. The door of the house was closed and fastened with a string to a nail in the post of the door. After calling several times for the fugitives and receiving no answer, the door was kicked open by my young master. The few articles of miserable furniture that the cabin contained, including a bed made of flags, were thrown into a heap in the corner, and fire was set to the dwelling by the overseer. We remained until the flames had reached the roof of the cabin when the gentlemen mounted their horses and set off for home, ordering me to return by the way that I had come. When we again reached the house of my master, several gentlemen of the neighborhood had assembled, drawn together by common interest that is felt amongst the planters, to punish theft, and particularly a theft of cotton in the bag. My young master related to his neighbors, with great apparent satisfaction, the exploits of the morning, said he had routed one receiver of stolen goods out of the country, and that all others of his character ought to be dealt with in the same manner. In this opinion, all the gentlemen present concurred, and after much conversation on the subject, it was agreed to call a general meeting for the purpose of devising the best, surest, and most peaceful method of removing from the country the many white men who, residing in the district without property or without interest in preserving the morals of the slaves, were believed to carry on an unlawful and criminal traffic with the Negroes to the great injury of the planters in general and of the masters of the slaves who dealt with the offenders in particular. I was present at this preliminary consultation, which took place at my master's cotton gin, whither the gentleman had repaired for the purpose of looking at the place where the cotton had been removed. So many cases of this forbidden traffic between the slaves and these white negro dealers, as they were termed, were here related by the different gentlemen, and so many white men were referred to by name as being concerned in this criminal business, that I began to suppose the losses of the planters in this way must be immense. This conference continued until I had totally forgotten the scrutinizing look that I had received from our overseer at the time I came up from the fishery in the morning. But the period had now come when I again was to be reminded of this circumstance, for on a sudden the overseer called me to come forward and let the gentleman see me. I again felt a sort of vague and undefinable apprehension that no good was to grow out of this examination of my person. But a command of our overseer was not to be disobeyed. After looking at my face with a kind of leer or side glance, one of the gentlemen, who was an entire stranger to me and whom I had never before seen, said, "'Boy, you appear to live well. How much meat does your master allow you in a week?' I was almost totally confounded at the name of meat, and felt the blood rush to my heart, but nevertheless forced a sort of smile upon my face, and replied, 
My master has been very kind to all his people of late, but has not allowed us any meat for some weeks. We have plenty of good bread and abundance of river fish, which, together with the heads and rows of the shad that we have salted at the landing, makes a very excellent living for us. Though, if master would please to give us a little meat now and then, we should be very thankful for it. This speech, which contained all the eloquence I was master of at the time, seemed to produce some effect in my favor, for the gentleman said nothing in reply, until the overseer, rising from a board on which he had been sitting, came close up to me and said, Charles, you need not tell lies about it. You have been eating meat. I know you have. No negro could look as fat and sleek and black and greasy as you if he had nothing to eat but cornbread and river chubs. You do not look at all as you did before you went to the fishery. And all the hands on the plantation have had as many chubs and other river fish as they could eat, as well as you. And yet they are as poor as snakes in comparison with you. Come, tell the truth. Let us know where you get the meat that you've been eating and you should not be whipped. I begged the overseer and the other gentlemen not to ridicule or make sport of me, because I was a poor slave and was obliged to live on bread and freshwater fish, and concluded this second harangue by expressing my thankfulness to God Almighty for giving me such good health and strength as to enable me to do my work and look so well as I did upon such poor fare, adding that if I only had as much bacon as I could eat, they would soon see a man of a different appearance from that which I now exhibited. "'None of your palaver,' rejoined the overseer. "'Why, I smell the meat in you this moment. Do I not see the grease as it runs out of your face?' I was by this time in a profuse sweat caused by the anxiety of my feelings, and simply said, "'Master sees me sweat, I suppose.' All the gentlemen present then declared, with one accord, that I must have been living on meat for a long time, as no negro, who had no meat to eat, could look as I did. And one of the company advised the overseer to whip me, and compel me to confess the truth. I have no doubt but this advice would have been practically followed, had it not been for a happy, though dangerous, suggestion of my own mind at this moment. It was no other than a proposal on my part that I should be taken to the landing, and if all the people there did not look as well and as much like meat-eaters as I did, then I would agree to be whipped in any way the gentleman should deem expedient. This offer on my part was instantly accepted by the gentleman, and it was agreed among them that they would all go to the landing with the overseer, partly for the purpose of seeing me condemned by the judgment to which I had voluntarily chosen to submit myself, and partly for the purpose of seeing my master's new fishery. We were quickly at the landing, though four miles distant, and I now felt confident that I should escape the dangers that beset me, provided the master of the fishery did not betray his own negligence and lead himself, as well as others, into new troubles. Though on foot, I was at the landing as soon as the gentleman, and was first to announce to the master the feats we had performed in the course of the day adding, with great emphasis, and even confidence in my manner, You know, Master Fishmaster, whether we have had any meat to eat here or not. If we had meat here, would not you see it? You have been up with us every night, and know that we have not been allowed to take even shad, let alone having meat to eat. The Fishmaster supported me in all I said, declared we had been good boys, had worked night and day, of his certain knowledge, as he had been with us all night and every night since we began to fish, that he had not allowed us to eat anything but fresh-water fish and the heads and rows of the shad that were salted at the landing. As to meat, he said he was willing to be qualified on a cartload of testaments that there had not been a pound at the landing since the commencement of the season, except that which he had in his own cabin. I had now acquired confidence, and desired the gentleman to look at Nero and the other hands, all of whom had as much the appearance of bacon-eaters as myself. This was the truth, especially with regard to one of the men, who was much fatter than I was. The gentlemen now began to doubt the evidence of their own senses, which they had held infallible heretofore. I showed the fine fish that we had to eat, cat, 
perch, mullets, and especially two large pikes that had been caught today, and assured them that, upon such fare as this, men must needs get fat. I now perceived that victory was with me for once. All the gentlemen faltered, hesitated, and began to talk of other affairs except the overseer, who still ran about the landing, swearing and scratching his head, and saying it was strange that we were so fat, whilst the hands on the plantation were as lean as sandhill cranes. He was obliged to give the affair over. He was no longer supported by my young master and his companions, all of whom congratulated themselves upon a discovery so useful and valuable to the planting interest, and all determined to provide as soon as possible a proper supply of fresh river fish for their hands. The two bales of cotton were never once named, and, I suppose, were not thought of by the gentlemen when at the landing, and this was well for Nero for such was the consternation and terror into which he was thrown by the presence of the gentlemen and their inquiries concerning our eating of meat, that the sweat rolled off him like rain from the plant never wet. His countenance was wild and haggard, and his knees shook like the wooden spring of a wheat fan. I believe that if they had charged him at once with stealing the cotton, he would have confessed the deed. End of chapter 11, part 2. Recording by James K. White. Chula Vista.